front of it off. The title of my message this morning is Scandalizing the Sacred. Our nation is slouching to Gomorrah. In fact, it is sprinting into the dark ages of self-destruction. The terrorist technique of demonizing and destroying the past is the way wicked men ruin what God has established. Our nation was founded on the principles of Christianity. Not all of our founding fathers were Christians in the sense we would define it today, but they certainly understood the principles of Christianity. They called upon God to defend their, their position and their freedoms that they, were, they believed in and were willing to give their lives for. And the evidence which proves this assertion that we were founded on Christianity is overwhelming. Sometime if you get a minute you ought to go and look under wall builders. Look for a guy named David Barton. I think he slowed down. He used to talk so fast you couldn't hardly keep up with him. But this guy is a walking encyclopedia of the founding fathers. And it's, it's incredible. In fact, my daughter-in-law didn't quite go along with this idea that we're based, but she saw the, a video he did. She said, okay, that convinces me. We are certainly based on Christian principles, our nation. Would you give the name again? David, David Barton. Barton. The name of his group is Wall Builders. So if you just type in YouTube, Wall Builders, you will see a video of David Barton. And find one that has to do with the Founding Fathers. At one point he goes through the rotunda of the Capitol building and they have all these pictures paintings of all these great men and he he goes to every one and he can tell you the whole history what, what they were all about and what they did what they believed what they and he goes to the next one said it's absolutely unbelievable that we've been robbed of our history even before this we've been robbed of our history people don't know the history in so many cases they don't teach them well we school. teach it we've ripped it out we're, we're gonna I'm going to get ahead of myself here so uh, it's proven, and specifically it's proven by two documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. All you got to do is read those two documents to know that we are based upon a Christian, the Christian principles of the Word of God. This is not arguable, not intelligently arguable anyway. Now the die was cast at Ecti, a la Aced Bill, the bottom of your banner. The die was cast in 1963 approximately when the Supreme Court threw out Bible reading and prayer from our public school system. That's, I believe, when the die was cast. Ten years later, you had abortion on demand. And then, of course, you had 20 years later or so, 30 years later, the homosexual agenda, marriage of homosexuality. So once you throw God out, what's left? Well, do your own thing. Whatever whatever you want to do. You have no standards by which you steer your ship. The rudder's gone. Got it? In our nation, that's what's happened. We've just gone out and we're going any direction and every direction. We have things like, I'm a man, but I say I'm a woman. Well, you know, it, it, it just goes, it never ends. The die is cast. Say goodbye to sanity. That's really what we ought to be saying. Now, the decline in civility is always preceded by a decline in morality. Well, we should be civil. Well, if you're immoral, there's no such thing as civility among men. <clears throat> Civilization uses statues and monuments of its past to preserve its heritage and strengthen its hopes for the future. God commanded the children of Israel that monuments concerning their history be built and preserved. Turn to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. This is the account of crossing the Jordan River at flood stage, by the way. You know, it wasn't crossed at when, the, when it was uh, six inches deep. It was crossed the Jordan River at flood stage. If you read the accounts, it's very clear. Verse 1 of Joshua chapter 4. Now, when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take
take for yourselves. God doesn't say don't didn't say take for my sake. Take for your sake. For yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet were standing. So if you don't know what happened is, uh, God, Joshua said, you, you stay about 2,000 cubits behind the priest, and they're going to carry the ark, and the minute their little toes touched the water, the water parted, and the, the ground was completely dry, and they marched out and stood in the middle of the Jordan River while the entire nation crossed. The guys got pretty probably pretty tired after a while. I remember when Moses had to have somebody prop up his hands while they were fighting the Amalekites because his hands got tired. But these guys were real he-men. They weren't a bunch of little wimpy. They're standing there in the middle of the Jordan River while the whole nation trots across the Jordan River to the promised land. They've been waiting for 400 and 30, long time, for over 400 years to get to the promised land. And carry them over, back, back to verse 3, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So pick up these big stones. And these things weren't some little five-pound stone. These guys were big guys, and they may have got some helpers too to help them out. But one guy was in charge, and they were going to pick out a big stone. I'm talking about something that you're going to look at and go, wow, look at that baby. Big stones. And set them up where you're going to lodge tonight. Verse 4. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Of Israel. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean? Now, so these things had to be big. They couldn't have been some little bit of stone that nobody would ever notice. They had to be big stones in somewhere where there weren't a bunch of other stones. So they would stand out prominently. So when your children ask, what do these stones mean to you? You shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial. I was telling Dave, as we're driving to Florida, there's always these brown signs on the interstate. Chickamauga Battlefield. Next right. Stephen Foster Memorial. I'm surprised they haven't torn that down. You know, you know, are you girls familiar with Stephen Foster? Way down upon the Swanee River. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. Sarah's nodding her head. She's, she'll have to teach you about Stephen Foster. His muse, he's one of the great American minstrel, muse musicians, but he used black music. Mint, they called it minstrel music. So they'll be tearing that down probably one of these days. So there's memorials or monuments. That's what God's telling the people of Israel. You set up this monument, a memorial, so that when your children ask, what does it mean? <coughs> you tell them. Amen? Now most of the heroes of our past are remembered because they endured calamity, chaos, and cruelty to preserve our culture and way of life. Think of, you, you, if you ever watch any of these World War II documentaries, it's amazing what our boys, especially at the Battle of the Bulge in the middle of winter time, their feet froze. It was horrible what they would do just to hold off the Germans from taking their little part of their lines. It makes you cry sometimes. I can't watch some of it when I see some of those men, their bodies there, and even on the beaches in Iwo Jima and the Guadalcanal and places like that. It's horrible what they endured to save our country. And what we, what's going on to destroy the statutes and uh, monuments which define American greatness is that these anarchists, that's what they want to create. These men died to stop cruelty. But these people want to create these whole things. We've We've had a couple conversations. Well, isn't it interesting that they're basically, they say they're trying to help the country, but they're 
Paul says in uh, Romans 13, uh, loving your neighbor means doing no wrong to your neighbor, no ill to your neighbor, or burning a business down or shooting somebody. Or, that's certainly doing ill to your neighbor, isn't it? Certainly not caring about your neighbor. So this morning I intend to show three things. First, that the past is our identity as a person and a people. Very important. Your past defines who you are and what you are. I think it was John was saying, we're basically made up of our past. Our whole life is a conglomeration of our past. Number two, that the past is re the reference for avoiding and correcting problems in the future and the present, present and the future. But you realize, folks, our whole lives are really made up of the past and the future because the present is an in, <coughs> it's an undefinable point that's moving. You understand? When you think about it, there's no, with, pre, the, nothing stands still. You know, Simon and Garfunkel sang this song, uh, slow down, you move too fast. Gotta make the moment last. There's no such thing as making the moment last because it's just zipping along. So our entire life is the past and the future. The present doesn't really exist, if you understand properly, spatially, abstractly. It doesn't really exist. Number three, that the past is the foundation for the future. By the way, that's why they're doing what they're doing. is because they want to destroy the past, that they can build a different future. Remember, this all started with Obama. Remember, he actually said, we're going to remake America. <clears throat> Transform, I think, was the word he used. America. Fundamentally transform. Fundamentally transform America. That was his whole goal, and it's being carried out right before our very eyes. Or it's attempted to be carried out right before. And if we don't do something, it's going to be. Got it? Number one, that the past is our identity as a person or a people. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. We'll start at verse 17. Now remember, the people of Israel had a, had a history that went all the way back to Abraham, didn't it? They, they, they always looked, whenever you talk, the Jews talked about anything, they always refer back to Abraham. Because he was their, the start of their particular people group. And when they went into the land, Moses wanted to make sure they remembered some things about their past. Because remember, the past is the foundation for the future. Verse 17, Deuteronomy, You shall not pervert the justice due an alien or an orphan, nor take a widow's garment in pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. You're supposed to remember your past, where you came from, what your life was like years ago, so you don't get proud, you don't get arrogant, you don't get overconfident. Because remember, you can go right back to where you were. You can work your way right up and end up right back where you were if you get too big-headed, too proud. Uh, you were slave. You were a slave in Egypt, and that the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. Here's what He wanted them to do: to remind them of what they had been. When you reap your harvest in the field, and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand. When you beat your olive tree, that doesn't mean like a wife, that means you shake it real hard to get all the olives to come out of it, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes for your vineyard, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. Hey, you better remember. You better go back and remember. Now, most of us have experience with someone who suffers from Alzheimer's or dementia. And folks, there's nothing more horrifying than that, is there? To, some, to see someone who does not know who they are or who their children are is the most horrible experience one can imagine. Isn't that right? I remember one time in the pizza parlor, an old man came in. He had a cane. It was late at night. We were about ready to close. And he ordered something. 
And then he began to tell me this story. He, he was weeping. So one time I was sitting in church with my wife and she turned to me and said, Who are you? And he just burst into tears. And folks, if you lose, you lose your identity, you don't even know who you are if you don't know about the past, if you can't remember and have memorials of your life. Amen? So turn to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes is part of what they call the wisdom literature in the Bible. Chapter 12, we'll start at verse 1. This is a description of what it means to get old. It's kind of interesting. He uses all the figures of speech here. I can give you that. Huh? I can you can give that. you that. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. What's the first word? Remember. Also your Creator in the days of your youth. Why? Because it's coming before the evil days come. That doesn't mean sinful days. That means getting old, getting decrepit, getting arthritis, getting losing your memory. Those are the evil days when you can't remember <coughs> the past. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened, you start to lose your eyesight. You can't really see very clear anymore. And the clouds return <clears throat> after the rain <laughs> in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and the mighty men stoop and the grinding stones stand idle because they are few and those who look through the windows grow dim. Your teeth get the grinding ones, your, your teeth, you can't chew up your food anymore, your teeth, you start losing your teeth. Get it? Verse 4, And the doors on the street are shut at the sound of the grinding is low, and one will arise at the sound of a bird, and the, all the daughters of song will sing softly. You can't hear very well, you can't sleep at night. You get up at the slightest thing, wakes you up in the middle of the night. Furthermore, Men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. You get to the place you don't want to drive your car anymore because you're afraid. Poor John, he, he kind of felt that way toward the end driving that big old semi. I wasn't as confident as I used to be driving it. Get it? And uh, uh, let's see, where was I? Look at that. High place, the terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and the caper berry is ineffective. You start losing it in many other ways. <laughs> For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Remember him. Before the silver cord is broken, and the golden bowl is crushed, and the pitcher by the well is shattered, as you fall and break your neck, or fall and knock your head and end up dying. And uh, the well is shattered, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. When the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. I know, but it's in there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hope we have, isn't it? And if we don't remember the past, we have no hope for the future. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right. Once memory is lost, there is no hope for the reconciliation of the sinner. Now, the saint, if you've been living right, that's not a problem. But if you're a sinner and you lose your, you just go through this thing, there's no hope then because you've lost. You don't even know who you are. Remember? 
All right, point number two. The past is the reference for avoiding and correcting problems. Now, the past is used by God as a reminder of the legitimacy of God's commands. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul brings this up to the church at Corinth. The past is used by God as a reminder of the legitimacy of His commands. This is very important. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Oh, praise God. Jesus. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Remember, all of them died, wandering around for 40 years. And many of them died in pestilence and other, remember the snakes that bit them? And uh, so they, there was all, and, and remember the ground opened up and swallowed up 254 of them, and then God burned a bunch of them. It, it swallowed up. Anyway, you, you remember those stories. Verse 5, verse 6. Now, these things happened as examples for us. The past is supposed to be a, an example. It's supposed to be a, a way we can correct the things in the future so that we would not crave the evil, evil things as they also crave. Do not be idolaters as some of, some, as some of them were. And as is, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Remember that's what happened at the golden calf. They're coming down off the mountain and Joshua says, I hear singing. <clears throat> and Moses says, it's not the singing of war. <laughs> you know. So they were played the idolaters. They played the fool. They worshipped a little golden calf. By the way, they never got rid of it. Jeroboam made two of them, one at Bethel and one at Dan, and they worshipped that golden calf for another 400 years. They even worshipped the stinking bronze serpent for 700 years mm -hmm. until, uh, until Hezekiah destroyed the thing. They even had a name for it. Verse 8, Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Remember that story? And uh, they're all weeping, and Zimri and Cosby go into the tent, and Phinehas takes a spear and spears them through and stop. But, and that, but 22,800, 23,000 rounded off, they were Simeonites, descendants of Simeon. So they ended up being the smallest tribe. In fact, Moses didn't even bless them. He blessed 11 tribes before they crossed, but he didn't even include Simeon. They're so little and they'd been so wicked. So the Simeonites died. Verse 10. Now verse 9, let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Or 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Remember that story? We want food. We want food. We want meat. We're, we're sick of this uh, manna. We, we don't like it. We're sick. So God, what God give them? Quail, two feet deep. Boy, imagine the stink when them things started dying. And the Bible says while it was in their mouth that the angel came down, they weren't, even, they weren't even thankful. They just started biting this stuff off and eating and God sent down and just slew. Uh, the plague went through and just slew them while the meat was still in their teeth. Verse 11, Now these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. You know, we don't teach all these things like George Washington when he fought in the Indian War and they found, what that guy say, uh, seven or eight holes in his clothes and he was not even shot. God had protected Abraham, uh, George Washington when he was fighting in the Indian Wars. There's many, many stories that aren't even taught anymore. The stories like this that were taught to the people of Israel. The Jews didn't teach their young people. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, our nation's history is filled with truths about our past. These truths are purposefully not taught or are distorted to fit into a radical world view. That's what you're seeing today, this, these radicals that are taking over. Turn to Judges chapter 2. By the way, nothing new is under the sun. These things have already happened before. 
in the past. Got it? It's just more real to us because it's happening to us today. But this isn't the first time this kind of stuff is happening. Judges chapter 2. We'll start at verse 6. Now remember, the book of Joshua is the account of Joshua and the people conquering the land. It took them about five years to conquer the land. And during that time, remember, uh, Reuben, half-tribe of uh, Manasseh, and Gad, they left all their families on the other side of the Jordan River. But they made a promise that they were going to stick with fighting until it was the rest of the land was conquered. Then they so those folks were gone for five years from their families while they fought to get the rest, gain the rest of the land. So verse six, when Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua. So here's two generations that served the Lord. Got it? the generation that crossed the Red Sea, and then their children, which had been the next generation, they served the Lord, two generations, who had seen the great, all the great work of the Lord which He had done for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 100, 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance at timnath Terez in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which He had done for Israel. Can you imagine that? Third generation. They didn't know. Their parents didn't teach them what had happened didn't take them down to the Jordan River and show them that pile of rocks. The Bible says, by the way, after Joshua piled up those rocks, the next day they circumcised the entire nation that hadn't been circumcised during the 40 years. And God said to Joshua, today I have rolled back the reproach of Egypt. That place was a sacred place people of Israel scandalized it because they didn't tell their children what had happened. Turn to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Start at verse 6. This is one of the most astonishing verses in the entire Bible, but it just proves what's going on in our country today. Exactly what's going on. Exodus 1. Verse 6, Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful, and increased greatly, and multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Verse 8, now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know, and you should put the word in your Bible, did not know about. Joseph, because 200 years had passed, so there was no way he would have ever even known Joseph. But he didn't even know about Joseph. Now, folks, how important was Joseph in the history of Egypt? Huh. Just to summarize, Joseph made Egypt the greatest superpower in the world in seven years. The Bible says that the famine was across the entire world and people brought money from everywhere to buy grain in Egypt. So all the wealth that had been accumulated around the world ended up in Egypt. Now he did a bad thing. He also introduced socialism. You understand? When the, when the drought started, the Egyptians owned their own property, had their own bank accounts, because remember there had been seven years of plenty. So they were raking in the dough from all the crops they had, because remember they had bumper crops for seven years. And he only took one-fifth to set aside, and then finally it got so much he couldn't even count it anymore. They owned their own property, 
They owned their own livestock. They had their own bank account. They were free. But what happened at the end of the seven years of drought? Their money was gone. Their livestock was gone. Their property was gone. And they enslaved themselves to Pharaoh to get food. And from that time, they kept working for Pharaoh. They only got to keep 20% every year. The rest of it all went to Pharaoh. Got it? Hey, that's where we're headed, big boys and big girls and young people, little girls and little boys. That's where we're headed in this country if we keep this up. Got it? Now it's, how do they get... Go ahead, Bill. One of the interesting things about the Egyptians is they used to erase. If they had a ruler that they didn't like or that became disfavorable, all records of him were clean. And that's kind of what these anarchists are trying to do today. Yeah. Wipe the record right. clean. By the way, why did they get rid of Joseph? He was a monotheist. Remember? The Egyptians were... They had ten gods. We know that from the ten plagues. He was a foreigner. Got it? So, of course... And he was number two. He was actually the most powerful man in Egypt. He was even more power. In a practical sense, he was more powerful than the Pharaoh was. So they had to write him out of the history books. And by the way, that's what they're doing in our history. They're writing out the truth about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, the pilgrims. They're writing it out of the history books just like they did with Joseph or any Pharaoh they didn't like. Got it? Very important that we understand this. Point number three. That the past is the foundation for the future. Now in the radical's mind, and by the way there are radicals in the churches, this social justice business is everywhere in the big churches. Marxism. Mark is pure Marxism. It's communism, but it's in the churches. So these radicals in church, government, and society are building a revolution based upon corrupted history and perverted, a perverted idea of social justice. Got it? The idea is, is that because we did some unjust things at the founding of our country, we're guilty. Even though no one alive today owns slaves and no one alive today has ever been a slave in the United States. Got it? Nobody. It's complete perversion. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll close with this. 2 Peter chapter 2. Maybe we won't. i got a couple more verses. I forgot about. I'll try to make this short. Hey folks, this same principle is happening in the church in our doctrine. Got it? We're, we're basically people don't know their Bibles. They don't know what's... The Bible is a history book. But we don't read the Bibles in churches anymore. Chuck was mentioning Billy Graham he used to always hold his Bible up when he would preach from the pulpit years ago. Got it? We need that. We need the Bible to return to prominence again because it's got history in it. It tells us where we came from, and it's the roadmap for the future. Chapter three, Second Peter, chapter three, verse fourteen. Everybody there? Therefore, beloved, <clears throat> since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace. Your job, you do it. You be diligent to be found by God in peace. Spotless and blameless. You do it. 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 14. Use your responsibility to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Paul is tough to... you got to really study Paul to get the gist. Sometimes it's... If you don't get the big picture and you try to just take one verse, you're going to be completely wrong. He says, which the untaught and unstable distort the words of Paul, the teaching of Paul, so that as they do all the rest of the Scriptures to their own 
destruction. That's what's happening. We're distorting our history. We're perverting our history to our own destruction. Got it? That's what's happening right now. We're scandalizing the sacred in our country. These monuments are sacred to us. These statues are sacred. They're part of our history. We're the greatest nation that's ever existed up till this point. All right, one more verse. Turn to Jude, chapter 1. We must not just sit around and watch this happen in our nation and in our families. At least we can, hey, you say, what, am I, what can I do? You can fix it in your family. Got it? That's what you can do. You can make sure that everyone within the sphere of your influence knows exactly how our country was founded, where it came from, what the principles were based on, and what these sacred statues represent. What do they mean? Why are they important? You can fix it in your family. You may not be able to fix it in somebody else's, but shame on you if you don't do it for your family. Your children, grandchildren, etc. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend. What's a contender? The fighter. He gets in the ring. He's willing to take it on the chin to win. You contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. It's been given to us. We've been given the most precious commodity in the universe. The truth. And if you don't tell the truth to your family, shame on you. Amen? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. we got them all over the church today. They're everywhere. They've crept in unnoticed. They sing so nice. Oh, man, they sing so great. They... That's what they... That's, we're, all, we're all about music. And we're all about, you know, how pre people say things and how they stand. And, oh, man, they're so cool. Oh, that new tap, it just turns me on. <laughs> hey, I'm not kidding you. It's there. Yeah. It's there. They have the Jesus talk. Jesus yeah. talk, yeah. Well, Tell me about it's that. It's religion, you know. They they know the terms. Yeah. Jesus and love and oh God and yeah yeah yeah. You know God loves you. Right. They, they got the terminology down. They mean differently than the Bible, but they do use the terminology. It's words without meaning is what they are. They pray. It's like the vain repetitions where it's just oh Father God Jesus Jesus yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It's, it's like, you ever hear these people pray, Oh, Father God, Oh, Jesus, Oh, Father God. They just re it's like vain repetition constantly. Really you don't, you, when you get done, you think, it's like a politician. What did he say? Mm -hmm. Right? Hey, say what you mean, mean what you say. So they've crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness, a license to sin. That's what licentiousness means. It's like handing them and say, here, that's what we do. Yeah, you're a Christian, you've been saved, go ahead. Jesus died so you can sin and still get to heaven. Now, they don't say it in exactly those words, but that's what they mean. It's pretty obvious. Because when you say to them, oh no, you're not supposed to sin, they get quite upset, don't they, Gene? Yeah. They, they don't want you around. Bye-bye. We're not really interested in hearing you anymore. La, 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 la. That's what they do. Cover their ears. They don't want to hear it. To deny, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So, don't you be caught guilty of scandalizing the sacred. Now, I don't want you either to make heroes out of people. Jesus Christ is our hero. He's our Lord and our Master. But we, are, we should not be denigrating, for whatever reason, the men that sacrificed so deeply to create and make our nation. And their statues and monuments, we ought to take our children there and explain to them who these men were, what they did. This is important. This is part of who we are. And if we lose that, we're lost, folks. You got it? Not only nationally, but especially as Christians. You better know your Bible. <clears throat> know the people in the Scriptures. What they did, what they stood for, how they lived their lives. Otherwise, as Christians, well, we're just kind of floating around because we don't have any anchor to, to 
you know, put ourselves, to anchor ourselves to. And this is the problem with getting rid of the Old Testament. These, many of these churches, they want to get rid of the Old Testament. Don't you dare fall prey to that, folks. Amen? We just, in our Sunday school lesson this morning, we pointed out that Paul says, that writes to Timothy and says, you were saved by basically, you, you got saved by reading the Old Testament. That's what he says to Timothy. So a man, a man can get saved by reading the Old Testament, according to Paul. Amen? You know, history keeps you humble. Amen. If you understand history and the truth, the truthful history, it keeps you humble. Amen. If you forget it or erase it, you become proud. Yeah, you think it revolves around you. Well, what's the greatest memorial that we have? Communion. Well, yeah, communion. Yeah, the cross. Do this in the way of remembrance. Remember, the remembrance of me. me. Yep. It's a tradition that was established by Jesus. Yep. It's a memorial. We, so we don't forget yep. history. Amen. The cross of Jesus Christ, and of course communion represents what occurred on that cross. Is the Gordon as you say is the greatest roadblock ever erected on the pathway of sin. Man wants to sin, he looks up there and he sees that cross and says, "No, if my sin sent Jesus to the cross, I'm never going to sin again." Amen. Well, the number one thing that evil men want to remove or get rid of is religion. Yes, it's true religion. True religion. True faith. The people that have faith and hope in a true God, you can't subjugate them. That's right. Amen. The um, head of Black Lives Matter was interviewed on TV, and he said, if they don't give us what we want, we'll just burn everything down and start all over. That's the whole point. And that's what they want to yep. do. They, so they want to do. Destroy it all and start system. over. But I tell you what, there's going to be a lot of people, uh, I for one, that I'm not going to stand by and let that happen. You know, we, we have a power, we still have the power of vote. Glad for that. That's they try to call the elections off because of this coronavirus. But let's be, let's stand firm starting with our faith. Because remember, our nation was based upon the true Christian faith, not a bunch of this so social justice garbage. Unfortunately, we can't put so much faith in the vote. Well, because I, I realize that, but I'm, I'm so still... There are so many counties yeah, where I know. the voter list is longer than the number of the people, people that, that are there. Live there well, that we, are you know what? We can't give up. And if we, if we take too much of an approach, it's just going to be throw up our hand. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to believe that God's bigger. Uh, we, have a, we have a song that they sing on Veggie Tales. Veggie Tales. Okay, what is it? God is bigger than the... Boogeyman. Say, and what, see, so much of this is the boogeyman. You know what I mean? He's and he sings the song, God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than your... Uh, that's something more you think on TV. So we just need, we have to remember something. Now God does demand that we govern, but if we pray, God will intervene on our behalf. As I believe that. If we pray, He says, ask you shall receive. And we ought to pray for our nation, that God will intervene in these things and stop these things from becoming, you know, where we just lose all hope. So, anybody have anything else you want to contribute here at the end? All right, Lord, we thank you.